Hey guys, Woodruff here. So this um, lecture is a part of my larger hypertension lecture. I'm breaking up these meds and trying to make them more simple because there's a lot of them. So sometimes, um, you know, looking at them in smaller chunks makes them feel more manageable. So let's get into first talking about diuretics. Um, we're specifically going to be talking about how diuretics can help with hypertension, but I am going to make a note on this slide um, we're going to talk a little bit about that there's a difference in giving a diuretic for hypertension than there is for heart failure. Um, so most people are pretty familiar with diuretics. They usually think they call them water pills and you know what's happening. They call them water pills because they make you pee like crazy. Um, so, um, you know, the way that they work when it comes to hypertension is sometimes hypertension, we have that, you know, equation for good blood pressure that we looked at back in my intro. And it talked about the fact that, you know, one part of component of blood pressure is good cardiac output. And one part of cardiac output is volume. And so if I have a lot of volume in my blood vessels, there's going to be more pressure. So this can help to get rid of extra pressure. Um, it also helps get rid of extra sodium, which can be a problem in hypertension. So if there's less volume, less sodium. If there's less sodium, there's less water in the first place. Uh, overall, less volume, less blood pressure. Um, so that's how it works in hypertension. I'll tell you, you know, like these are definitely used for hypertension, but it's not usually the first medication you see used for hypertension. Um, some patients definitely end up on these, um, but most of the time, if I have a patient on a diuretic, I'm thinking that they have heart failure or fluid overload or something else going. Cause usually we give it to patients that have a fluid issue. I'm um, not necessarily for hypertension, but again, it definitely can be used for hypertension, but I don't want you to think that okay, the, anytime you give a diuretic, I'm giving it to lower their blood pressure. Um, so um, the, like I said, there's a difference between why we give it for hypertension and then why we give it for heart failure. So for hypertension, um, I'm trying to lower their blood pressure. That's my goal. For all blood pressure treatment, my goal is, is to get their blood pressure lower. Um, but when it comes to heart failure, we have a different issue going on. We have this fluid overload. Um, so we'll talk about heart failure later, but just realize like in a test question, this could really throw you off. If you had a test question that said, hey, you have a patient who has hypertension, they're getting this medication. Um, how do I know it worked? I'll know a medication that's a diuretic for hypertension worked. If their blood pressure gets lower, I'm giving it to lower their blood pressure. When it says how do I know it worked? It's really telling you for this patient, this med, what's the outcome I'm hoping for? Um, but remember, meds can have different um, uses for different conditions. So then there's also heart failure. So if you had the same question, they're getting this um, diuretic and um, they have heart failure. Um, how do I know it's effective? It's going to be different. I'm not hoping their blood pressure goes down when I give it for heart failure. We actually give diuretics for a very different reason for heart failure. Um, we give diuretics um, in heart failure in order to decrease fluid load. Um, and where does fluid accumulate in heart failure? It accumulates in the lungs and the legs are two of the big places. Um, so, you know, to know that it's effective, um, it's not going to be their blood pressure goes down. Um, for a diuretic and heart failure, I'm going to know that it's effective because their lungs are more clear. They're having less wet sounds. They're having decreased edema in their legs, um, things like that. Um, the other thing that I want to note about effectiveness in diuretics is a lot of times students can get confused and they think that effectiveness is measured by how much they pee. Now, if this patient pees a lot after this, I'm going to be happy about that. I want that. It's usually a sign, hey, the medicine went in the IV. It is working. They are diuresing. Um, but we always want to look at the end outcome. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, especially we'll talk about this when we get to heart failure. Um, you know, a lot of times if I ask a student like, hey, how do I know a diuretic is effective? They're like, oh, they peed. But you always want to think about a patient can pee a whole lot. But what's the end um, goal of that? Other the end, oh, sorry, the end um, outcome of that. So I've had patients before that um, have, I've like given them them a diuretic, they've actually gotten a lot of urine out, like liters and liters and liters of urine. Um, but they, they, their lungs are still wet. Their legs are still full of fluid. Their blood pressure is still up. Um, so is it really working? Um, so to really see that it's effective, um, you know, we want to look at more measures, like bigger measures that they have less fluid on board, if that's why I'm giving it, or, or their blood pressure is lower, if that's why I'm giving it. Um, so you always want to be thinking more like which, which function in the body can really show me like why I'm giving it. Because again, for heart failure, 
failure. I'm not giving it to hope that they pee. I'm giving it to hope that they have an easier ability to breathe, an easier ability to move around because their legs aren't, you know, four plus edema. Um, that's why I'm really giving it to decrease, you know, I mean, long term, of course, to decrease the workload on the heart. So we really want to look for direct measures. Um, so you want to think about why you're giving it and you want to think about which patient, how it's really going to help them. And then what is that really direct measure that's going to tell me um, that they're better? Because um, again, a patient can pee a whole lot, but what's their blood pressure? So we always want to get back to like, okay, so I'm giving it, they pee three liters. Like if a doc, oh, oh, this is the last thing I say, I'll promise on this is like, I always try to tell my students, like, think about the practicality that if a doctor came up to you and said, hey, how's the diuretic working? Um, like you could say, oh, they peed three liters and they'll probably be like, okay, cool. But like, you know, they want to look at the end measures too, because they're not giving it to uh, make them pee. They're giving it to help them to have a better function in one of their organs, to have lower blood pressure, to have less um, wet lung sounds. So that's what we really want to go to. They want to look at those end outcome measures of um, this medication working. All right. So there is um, a few different classes of medications when it comes to diuretics. There's thiazide diuretics, there's loop diuretics, and then there's potassium sparing diuretics. Um, so first thiazide diuretics, and these are used, you'll see them used fairly often. Um, usually, you know, more of a first line, it's going to be things like loop diuretics, but you won't see loop diuretics used as often for um, hypertension. Now thiazide diuretics like hydrochlorothiazide, you're going to see that used a lot more often when it comes to hypertension. I'm talking diuretics in general, usually the one everyone knows are the loop diuretics, but thiazides are used more often when it comes to hypertension. Um, so with these patients and really with all diuretics, stuff that you're going to want to do for all of them is to monitor their eyes and O's. Um, and when we think about diuretics, what you want to think about is what's going on with my fluid and what's going on with my potassium. Um, cause when I'm having this diuresis, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, what, what tends to happen, what not tends to happen, what does happen in these patients is, um, the diuretics are either going to cause them to lose potassium or it's going to cause them to hold on potassium. Now you do not need to understand in the deep level of uh, the kidneys, what actually is going on inside the kidneys. Um, but what you should know or want to know um, is, um, you know, like, how is like, what am I going to be concerned about? Or what am I going to look for? Um, so um, with thiazide diuretics and loop diuretics, both of these are potassium wasting diuretics, or they get rid of or they're wasting potassium, it's going down the drain. Um, so they're losing potassium. So you want to think about before I give this med, I need to know what the patient's potassium is. If it's low, I'm not giving it. Um, you know, I have to make sure their potassium is at a safe level before I give this because this medicine is only going to make it go even lower than what it already is. Because when you think about low potassium, you're going to think about dysrhythmias and death. And so, yes, not like, I'm not trying to be dramatic, but you know, that's, that's the, the double D's that come with a low potassium. Um, we always want to remember what a normal potassium is that 3.5 to five. Um, another thing that's different about thiazide diuretics and specific to this one is that they can lead to acid base imbalances like alkalosis, um, just as a result of the way that they work. Um, some teaching specific for thiazides is, is that they can be dangerous, um, you know, for patients that are also on digoxin and NSAIDs, there can be some interactions. Um, and then because I'm losing potassium, I want to tell this patient they need to supplement extra potassium in their diet. We'll talk more about um, potassium foods later. Um, also with all diuretics, we want to make sure that they take those in the morning um, at, it, because we want to think about what this medication is going to make them do. Um, so all diuretics are going to make a uh, patient pee more. And if they're going to be getting up and peeing, do we want them to do it in the middle of the night? Do we want them waking up all throughout the night to pee? No, we don't. So we want to give it first thing in the morning for safety reasons, and also just to um, complement or uh, encourage their sleep because the beautiful heart needs its rest. All right, now let's talk about loop diuretics. So this is probably the most common type of diuretic and the kind that most people are familiar with or aware of. Um, and so um, this is going to be things, and I have all the mnemonics and other stuff at the top if that helps. Um, this is the most common type of diuretic. Uh, most people are, are most familiar with furosemide, but there's other types too. Um, and so the thing about loop diuretics that are different are they're very potent. So even if my kidneys are not working, they're shutting down, they're hurting. So like, you know, the kidneys get their feelings hurt all the time. They're the very sensitive friend um, out of all the organs. Um, and that um, we want to make sure that 
um, uh, you know, we're giving the, we're not going to hurt the kidneys even more. But the great thing is that like when um, most diuretics are going to be hard on the kidneys, um, and, mm, that's something I'm going to want to add in there is we want to check kidney function. So um, back up to thiazide diuretics. So you always want to check kidney function because the diuretics can hurt your kidneys, but the only medication that will still work, even if uh, the only, sorry, no, the only diuretic that will still work, even when your kidneys aren't working great, is going to be loop diuretics. And in other words, if there's any hope of a diuretic working, you got to try the loop. Um, so I'll update this PowerPoint. It might look a little different if you're in my class, because I'm probably going to add in that um, stuff, uh, you know, with that, or I might add it after we'll see. But um, I'm always looking to like, sometimes I don't know till I'm starting to talk about it, that I'm like, Ooh, I want to add this. Or I want to rearrange this. Or I'm like, Oh, I could add, or I could have done this differently. So if this looks a little different and you're watching back or you're filling in my fill in the blank notes, um, just know it's uh, I apologize. I know it might be a little different, but I promise you're not missing too much. Um, and I always post my PowerPoint slides on the Google Drive. So you can always um, go and match with that. Anyway, um, where was I? So uh, when it comes to um, uh, these, like I said, they're very potent where again, we're going to monitor the intake and output. And again, it's a potassium wasting, so it can lower potassium. So, um, the only other thing that's different here, I'm also going to tell them, Hey, eat more sodium rich, uh, uh, sorry, sodium, ha, just kidding. I'm gonna eat more potassium rich foods, um, and take it in the morning. So you're not falling all night long or, um, you know, up all night long peeing. Um, but the other thing that's different is going to be that if you give this IV push, it can be ototoxic or it can cause hearing loss. So you need to push it slowly. So really, if you look at this, if you're starting to process this, um, aside from, you know, getting the names done in the classes and things like that, the only other thing that's different between the thighs and the loop is thiazides can cause that acid base imbalance. And then the loops are really potent and um, they work even when your kidneys aren't working and they can be ototoxic. Those are like the only two things. So really start noting just what's different about these versus what's the same. Oh, here we have a medication scenario. These are scattered throughout. So let's enjoy. Let's look at this. So client is due for furosemide 40 milligrams PO. So to answer this question, you know, if this was on a test, um, you know, first I would have to know what furosemide is. So that's why, you know, you do have to know your meds. And if you're, um, you know, you're not at a school that gives you a note card or something to study, um, then you're going um, to, to have at the test with you. Um, and then you're definitely going to want to have, um, you know, uh, something on, uh, you know, something uh, like note flashcards, stuff like that to help Help you to study or memorize these. That's why I think mnemonics help. But remember, you don't need to remember every med, just focus on what is in them. So kind of like these mnemonics I have here, Zydmide, Nide Zone, um, those are all the potassium sparing diuretics. So anyway, furosemide, which if I know it's a potassium sparing diuretic, um, the nurse checks their labs and notices their potassium is 2.5. Um, so it depends kind of on where you're at. If you just gave some, it would need to be replaced, but it looks like it's due. So like I mentioned earlier, if I have a potassium sparing diuretic and it is due and um, I check my potassium, it's 2.5. It is not safe to give that furosemide. So what our, our best action is to um, hold the potassium, uh, hold the potassium. See, I'm going to keep doing this. Hold the furosemide, call the doctor and get an order for potassium replacement. Now, once that potassium is replaced, then I can give that furosemide. And yes, it is kind of like a continuous cycle. Um, you know, what we do, because you might be saying like, aren't you just chasing the potassium all the time? Yes. Um, but um, that's the story of life on people with uh, people with diuretics, what we're doing. Um but those dietary changes, and most of these patients end up on daily potassium supplements, which are these huge horse pills, cause a lot of GI upset. So uh, make sure that, that they take them with food. Um, but um, what you also want to consider here, we can also do other things like um, some patients are going to be on potassium wasting diuretics and a potassium sparing. Um, the potassium sparing, and I'm a, which I'm about to talk about, are weaker diuretics. I mean, you may be saying, oh, why would you give a wasting and a sparing? It helps balance it out so you don't waste as much potassium, but still has, and it kind of has a um, adjunctive diuretic effect. So it is possible for a person to be on both types of diuretics, potassium wasting and potassium sparing. Because remember, we're not giving it to waste the potassium. So like, if you're wondering like, why would you waste potassium, but also spare it? Uh, this is just a side effect of the med. So, um, you know, we're not trying to waste potassium or get rid of potassium. Um, you know, so for a patient with hypertension, this is just a side effect. So if uh, they're on, you know, long-term, let's say they're on hydrochlorothiazide and I want them to, um, you know, I want their blood pressure to improve, but I just can't seem to catch up with their potassium. Sometimes they might add on a potassium wasting diuretic. So, uh, potassium sparing diuretic is what I meant to say at the end there. Um, 
if you see how much I have twisted my words and I'm, I'm not stupid. <laughs> I just, to show you, I'm not doing it on purpose either to show you how easy it is to mix these things up. So definitely be careful when you're saying wasting, sparing, you know, you can get your, your words mixed up. So whatever's going to help you. So anyway, there's a couple different, um, there's two classes of potassium sparing. There's like actual, what are called potassium sparing diuretics. And there's also what's known as aldosterone blockers. Um, but as a whole, we consider them potassium sparing diuretics. Um, it, like we're not going to sit there and trick you or we're not going to be asking you, is this an aldosterone blocker or is this a potassium sparing? Like it's all the same. Aldosterone blockers are potassium sparing diuretics too. Like and in the sense that they are sparing potassium. Um, so these work um, a little bit different. And again, you don't need to know deep into the pathophysiologies, but these work in a way that will help you so you don't lose as much potassium, which is great. But the one thing to keep in mind, like I said, is they're usually a little bit weaker. They're not as strong as other diuretics diuretics like loop diuretics. Um, so these can be used, and especially for people that just can't tolerate the potassium supplements, or maybe this is enough for them, they may try these. Um, it just depends on the patient and what their needs are. Um, or like I said, they can be on both. Um, so it's uh, the only things, um, everything is pretty much the same from all the other diuretics take in the morning, monitor intake and output closely, um, that kind of stuff. But the only difference is, is now instead of wanting to increase the potassium in my diet, I want to avoid extra potassium in my diet. Um, and I want to, uh, I want to be careful around patients who can't handle potassium or too much potassium. Um, so um the difference is, is that we want to keep an eye for an increased potassium. They could actually have an unsafe increase. And um, you haven't really learned about this yet, at least if you're at my school. But um, in patients with renal failure, they cannot get rid of potassium. So if I'm taking a med that already holds on to potassium and I have a patient who can't manage potassium well, um, then I'm going to be, um, you know, concerned or maybe wanting to call the physician, hey, is this appropriate? Um, so I definitely want to check their kidney function um, and see, um, you know, how it's going before this, um, before giving this medication and, you know, make sure that the doctor knows about their kidney function. But generally people that are in like actual renal failure on dialysis, things like that probably would not be taking this medication for their hypertension. Now people with kidney failure need hypertension meds, but this is probably not going to be the uh, medication of choice because of the potassium increase. We're also going to learn later about ACEs and ARBs, and these are um, angiotensin receptor blockers and uh, what we call angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. Um, I might have, I believe I said that right. Um, and so um, these are another antihypertensive, and we're going to talk about them, but let's see if the problem with these is that they um, hold on to too much potassium, why would I not want to take another med for hypertension? Well, if you kind of can deduce it, ACEs and ARBs also increase your potassium. So effectively look at this way. With potassium sparing diuretics, it's all the same as the other diuretics. Monitor intake and output, take first thing in the morning. Um, you know, same thing, change position slowly. Um, all that stuff's the same. But the only difference is, is that I don't want to do, um, do it. things that are going to increase my potassium, like taking other meds that increase my potassium. I don't want to give it to patients that can't manage potassium well, like renal failure patients. And then I also want to look at diet. I want to make sure that they're not taking any potassium supplements. Um, and something else to consider is that these patients are most likely on a cardiac diet. And since we don't like salt for cardiac patients, we give them salt substitutes. But one thing, if you don't know, this is salt substitutes have a lot of potassium. Um, so as a result of that, um, it definitely can lead to some uh, what do you call it? Um, problems because a lot of patients don't realize that they're like, oh, I'm sticking to my diet using my salt substitute, but they don't realize that salt substitutes are potassium. Um, and so um, you definitely want to be careful. So effectively avoid other meds and other supplements and things that might have potassium in them. Um, don't give it to patients that have, um, you know, uh, kidney problems because it can lead to unsafe rise in the potassium and watch that potassium closely. So let's talk about foods that are high in potassium. So there is a variety of foods that are high in potassium. And you want to think about if I'm on a loop or a thiazide diuretic, I want more of these because I'm wasting potassium. But if you're on a potassium sparing diuretic, aldosterone blocker, all the ones from the last slide, I want less of these. So it's going to be things like citrus juices, bananas, potatoes, fish, tomatoes, potatoes, tomatoes, you know. All right, I'm not, I'm not going to sing the Thanksgiving song, I promise. I'll save that 
that, you know, maybe in my older age when I'm senile and can get away with it and people just think I'm cute, um, you know, singing these songs, I may try a singing career, but not for now, I promise. Um, Beans is another one that you can add there. So um, let's do another scenario. So we have, uh, and I feel like I keep giving you the answer for these before I get to them. <laughs> so don't mind me over here, not me over here giving you the answer before we can even do the question because I didn't remember which scenarios I put in here. So don't mind me. Um, so the nurse checks the order for a client and notices the following that they have hydrochlorothiazide, 50 milligrams PO daily and spironolactone, 50 milligrams, pre, uh, 50 milligrams PO daily. Um, is it safe to give, or is there anything the nurse needs to check or clarify first. So um, these are two meds and one of them is a potassium wasting diuretic, which is hydrochlorothiazide and one is a potassium sparing diuretic, the spironolactone. Um, and so these both, like I mentioned, can be given together. You can give two diuretics together, um, but you just want to be one, like making sure that you're, I wouldn't give two potassium wasting diuretics together or two potassium sparing diuretics together because um, it's going to lead to unsafe um, change. Now, regardless Regardless of, you might say like, oh, these are going to balance them each other out. My potassium is going to be good. I don't know. So I'm still going to check my potassium before giving it and make sure that it is safe to give. Um, because again, you know, with these medications, it's not just that you put them both on and then there's this magical balance. Sometimes it might sway to one um, direction or another, depending on how the patient tolerates the med. Um, so yeah, so it is safe to give after checking my potassium if my potassium is in normal range. I think that's it. Yep. That's it for diuretics. I hope this helped. See you for the next meds.